Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and more specifically, trans, transitional justice. We're going to talk today uh, with uh, Bodan Berdadetsky in Kiev, in Ukraine, about sanctions against Russia. Bodan, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Aloha, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. So uh, tell us about your training and what you're doing in your life these days. Uh, my main affiliation connects with uh, National University of Kiev Mahila Academy, where I'm studying students uh, international law, namely diplomatic and the law of treaties. Uh, at the same time, I help in Ukrainian MPs, uh, government, in topics related to sanctions, uh, foreign policy issues, interparliamentary assembly, and so on. So I'm glad and happy. To see you here to speak with you and to share the word about ukraine about the war uh within your community yes okay great i mean i'm likewise very happy to talk to you it's very important that we keep in touch with people like you and we follow what's happening in, in ukraine um because the you know the news cycle moves on and before you know it something else gets to the top of the priorities and we want to make sure that ukraine is always at the top of the priorities, always. Um, what's happening to you is happening to the world. What's happening to you is what's happening to the liberal world order. And we must protect you. That's my view of it. So let, let's talk first about um, let's talk first about the, um, the sanctions. Um, you know, some people say the sanctions are doing uh, real damage to the Russian economy. Other people say, uh, including Mr. Putin. Uh, that they're not they're not doing a lot to the Russian economy and that he can tolerate them. Uh, what's your view of that? I was amazed uh, a few days ago, if you remember, uh, Putin gathered his so-called economic forum in St. Petersburg, where he was uh, calling, like he's always calling, that Russia cannot be isolated. <laughs> And uh, on the other hand, uh, you always see his messages related uh, that uh, economic sanctions do not work and Russia will stay strong under sanctions pressure. So these two types of messages as usually uh, are inevitable and are opposite to each other, which are promoted uh, by Kremlin. And uh, if we see uh, deeper and if we uh, like see the underneath and uh, of this scape, uh, we, we, we see that uh, sanctions damage uh, damages uh, to Russian economy are high and great. Despite many uh, uh, factors uh, surrounding uh, what we may call sanctions analytics, which now uh, display in us that um, Russian economy is getting back on its feet, the Russian economy, like uh, put under control uh, the volatility of rubble. Uh, like uh, the inflation rate is not so high um, comparing to other European uh, countries. Uh, the, central bank, the central bank is uh, controlling uh, emission of rubble. Uh, on the other hand, it uh, blocked US and Euro conversation rates at some degree. So it uh, stopped uh falling down russian rubble and so everything like they claim working well now but uh, we see other part of metal we see other part of story when we go in deeper into details and the first thing and first trap for russian economy is that uh technologies technological companies uh, high-tech companies uh companies which are working in fields in the fields in the critical fields of russian infrastructure companies like siemens uh, or uh, companies which producing 
supply for Russian oil industry are now leaving country. And uh, Russia state will never manage to remaster to uh, like uh, to repeat uh, uh, this type of story so uh, like technological uh, technological um, i would say um, backstep in russian economy is now great even uh, at the beginning of this three months uh, new wake of war in ukraine so the war is continuing for eight years not for three months but it's a new stage of this war uh, you know uh, i don't know if you get uh, 60 minutes was a popular news tv program on sunday nights here in the u.s but there were two articles uh, two segments on the, the program just last night that relate to this and i wanted to ask you about them one is uh, one is a news story about the uh, oligarchs and how they are investing huge amounts of money in the UK, and they're buying properties in the UK, and they're buying legislators, members of parliament in the UK, trying to establish uh, greater influence in the government and change government policy so as it is not um, anti-Russian. <clears throat> and that was of great concern to a number of um, of members of parliament who spoke against it uh, in parliament. Um, the other story uh, had to do with um, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. Uh, he's a total uh, autocrat, a dictator in the old-fashioned sense. His, his opposition candidates disappear. Uh, the same way uh, no Navalny has disappeared uh, under false charges in Russia. Same thing. <clears throat> and it appears that, uh, that Putin is also supporting Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. And is uh, building, you know, military facilities there, and giving Ortega money, and so forth. So what you have in the war against Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, is a is a hybrid. It's a hybrid war, an asynchronous war where it's not just bullets, it's not just kinetic um, military action. It is everything and anything, uh, including this. Uh, this uh, effort to compromise the UK uh, and to develop uh, an ally of Russia in, in the backyard of the United States in Nicaragua. Uh, what are your comments about that? Um, can Putin afford to do that? Uh, is the, uh, are the sanctions affecting that? Um, why, why, did, why does he do that? What does he hope to achieve by continuing his global effort uh, to compromise other countries? Like primarily, we should uh, recognize that uh, at the initial phase of this new intervention, Putin gained defeated in Ukraine, and now he will look uh, for other options to make the best in what he can to do in the hybrid warfare, which combines. Uh, legal warfare, political warfare, and uh, military warfare. So there is combination. And uh, his army shows that it is uh, complete uh, disappointing when uh, Russia spends uh, like budgets and budgets, billion budgets of dollars for its army and uh, has no result which it pretends to like uh uk united kingdom london is a unique story because uh for a while russian oligarchs uh, members of uh, families of russian elites plus uh, families of uh, russian political um, uh, of russian political officials they will live and spend in their money in London, and we know that uh, districts will under um, the like they buy, buy not only flats or like houses; they buy districts there. Um, and uh, now the stance of London of uh, Prime Minister Johnson is very strong and appealing to the world. 
we see that he had visited Ukraine for two times now, and uh, it shows a great uh, sign. Again, uh, United Kingdom sanctions are now the toughest one and the strongest one. They uh, recently uh, put under sanctions Patriarch Kirill, uh, which is a pretending situation because it was for the first time we see on the sanctions list a uh, person from uh which mainly affiliated with the uh, religion community but like everyone knows uh, outside russia that he's uh, only one uh one other agent from kgb but he mainly affiliates himself with religion so uh i know that in the european union uh, like according to many reports there were a huge battle between hungary and uh, like other member states to put uh, patriarch kirill under sanctions too but uh, they failed to do to do so now and london uh takes uh the step uh and and, and shows the result and so uh despite despite uh, now uh the value of russian money there it's obviously great. Uh, they proved to be independent in matters of foreign policy. There are many reasons why they doing so. First reason and the obvious one is that they uh, leaves uh, European Union and they need to show that they are still the global power, that they are still a global financial center. And they they still like can dictate the rules, not to follow and not to obey, but to dictate and uh, to be like great again, but in the United Kingdom uh, variant. Uh, because uh, what they're showing now, it's uh, the highest level of being independent. And the second reason is that uh, they were dependent uh, like because of, of money of Russian oligarch. But the structure of British economy shows little uh, dependency on Russian economy. It's not the case of Hungary, it's not the case of central part European countries where uh, like Russian economy ties much, might be much more stronger than Britain. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be, uh, several other reasons uh, to add to this and uh, they, they, they did well and Ukraine respects their decisions uh, so much. And you mean uh, sanctions against Nicaragua? I, I just would wonder like to interconnect somehow the discussion around sanctions, mentioning not Nicaragua but Venezuela um if i may because uh, I, I, we see this uh, recent reports regarding that um, uh, president biden his administration is uh, now in contact with venezuela in formal contacts in venezuela and they asking uh, them uh, in change of uh, lifting a certain oil embargo uh, limitations on the oil embargo uh, and like to lift in certain economic sanctions against them why are they doing it because they see that if uh, sanctions against russia continues uh, prices uh, in global oil market will rise and uh, i believe it's a good decision because uh, sanctions is not a panacea is not a solution for any and uh, type of threats but basically uh, the threat to the peace is the main one and the most uh, important one in the international relations international law so uh, if like joint and uh, western world including united states united kingdom europe uh, doing together in uh, response to the threat it should consider the fact that threat to the peace is the main one. And uh, 
we cannot simply say about protection of human rights or like uh, rule of law because once uh, russia capture here territories there will be territories without any rule of law and human rights at all so uh, they did great that uh, they do great because they now uh, considering how to contract to russian oil prices and to find other solutions which they may trigger uh, where they can impact and uh, where they can put uh, more pressure economic pressure on russia because oil prices will go down if uh, sanctions against venezuela will be lifted well, one question that comes to my mind, uh, Bodan, is uh, what what other maybe you can help me with this. What other sanctions would be appropriate if you um, if you could give advice to the coalition and to President Biden? Um, would you advise them to apply additional sanctions? Uh, and what would those sanctions be? I would say that, like now, uh, the sanctions portfolio. Uh, uh, sanctions portfolio is almost full, and the United States uh, in uh, sanctions track uh, does a lot of stuff. And uh, I guess that like it's more than fifty or sixty percent that it can do now by now. Uh, it should be continued like with sanctions of persons. Uh, individual sanctions against Russian oligarchs, because uh, as recently I see that not all oligarchs, it's only like about 10 out of 20 uh, oligarchs are now under US sanctions. Uh, again, it should be targeted against uh, family members who are living now in the United States and spending um, corrupted, uh, their corrupt assets in the United States. It should be a separate track and now that it was created special task force. And the main one idea is that uh, sanctions, uh, and uh, it was discussed uh, between Biden and uh, con uh, Congress and Senate, uh, that uh, assets which are now frozen under sanctions should be uh, under certain type of international agreement or under um, informal agreement, let's say so, be transferred uh, to the recovery of Ukraine as a compensation uh, for the damages that uh, that is is causing now by Russia. So, like the third point now, I believe is the main one. And uh, it now goes aside somehow and is a disturbing uh, notion. Because uh, like almost all types of sanctions are now in place, which the United States and Europe can propose. We can only expect from Euro gas embargo, for instance. Uh, but it's a long story we see now. And um, um, I believe that the role of United States now is uh, fitted better within um, within international diplomacy when the President Biden uh, like defends Ukraine abroad with uh, when talking to Asia region region and saying that uh, if Ukraine uh, doesn't stand, it will be the next war there. And uh, all countries uh, in the Western Pacific should, uh, uh, not in the Western, East and Western Pacific, should understand that uh, how aggressor put the responsibility is a, uh, is a practice. And this practice will um, be the following one in case of next war there. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, an oligarch's yacht um, worth uh, something over $300 million seized in Fiji at the request of the Biden administration, and which was then taken to Honolulu, where I am. Um, and it, 
it is sitting uh, three or four miles away from where I am sitting, uh, tied up in Honolulu Harbor. And uh, uh, as you say, uh, this what should happen is this yacht should be sold, and that's 300 plus million that could go, should go, uh, to compensate Ukraine for the damages that it has incurred. And however, that is a drop in the bucket compared to the full extent of the damages that Ukraine has incurred. Uh, and you get two points of relief on that beyond seizing oligarch yachts and funds uh, in whatever banks, is, is first to get lawsuits by individual Ukrainians in the courts of other countries where Russian assets exist, uh, seeking compensation. Um, second is you get war crimes investigation, war crimes tribunals, uh, which uh, can, from the civil side, uh, provide compensation to Ukraine and the people who have been the victims of war crimes. Um, and I want to ask you about that. Uh, for me, I would like to see those civil suits on behalf of individual Ukrainians whose families have been killed, tortured, what have you. When properties destroyed, uh, you know, uh, uh, sent back to Russia and the like, um, and various other war crimes on a civil basis. And then I would like to see the investigation of uh, war crimes in general as war crimes under, under international law uh, pursued. And I understood last time around there was something in the order of 5,000 investigators uh, from outside Ukraine, in Ukraine. Uh, doing that investigation. I, and I wonder how much investigation is necessary. This is like the insurrection investigation pending in Congress, in the U.S. Congress right now. We saw it on television. And we saw what happened in Ukraine and Bukha on television. So the proof of the war crimes and that the Russians did the war crimes is very clear. And so query, how much investigation do we need? How much um, investigation do these individual Ukrainian plaintiffs need, victims and uh, those who have lost family, lost businesses, lost property? Um, don't we already know what happened? What else do we need to do to pursue all these claims? You, you know, uh, you should go and see this yacht in, in your harbor and to take the picture. <laughs> Uh, for sure, because I believe uh, Russian oligarchs uh, owns uh, own the best yacht in the world, the longest one, the biggest one, and so. On. But uh, returning back to victims of war and war criminals, you know, it's a long story, which will not end in even next few years. Why I'm a bit skeptical about uh, civil suits in other jurisdiction. It might work for big companies like international companies, companies which had, which have uh, like foreign branches, but it will not work for the majority of people who are victims of the war. They simply cannot, uh, let, let's say, charge uh and employ american lawyer european lawyer uh, to make the civil suit there it will not work as an option uh to cover uh, to cover like expenses to cover damages that victims of war gained and again the best option is international agreement international body specialized international body trust fund uh which be specifically devoted uh, to managing uh, russian frozen assets uh, which are now counting around uh, i would like not to be um, say a mistake here but uh, as the recent numbers were about uh, half of damage, damages Ukraine uh, calculate, so it at least can uh, compensate half of these damages. And we can then think of how to cover the other part of these damages. 
but again, uh, this option will work much more better because it will be international mechanism approved and adopted and uh, supported by at least G G7 countries plus European Union. So we have basically, we have uh, SOTI and then we can join Japan, uh, South Korea and other countries which now put sanctions uh, on Russia uh, and having like at least 40 countries on board. It will show um, it, it. It will show the result because you see that uh, it will be a consequences uh, for any aggressor. Uh, okay, he aggr the aggressor may consider like to withdraw money before the invasion, <laughs> but on the other hand of the story, the aggressor will show that the international community will find mechanisms uh, to make money of aggressor for compensation of the victim of aggression. So basically, I believe the best option is international agreement for frozen Russian assets. I know this is a complicated story, but uh, I know that the United States is uh, devote so much attention to money, which as they now support in Ukraine and uh, Russian money should be central one here because Russia is uh, only state and uh, country responsible for that. Hmm. So what has to happen before we get to an end game um, on these claims, these claims of war crimes? Uh, now investigation uh, are in line and uh, I even see the first uh, sentence on uh, war crime in Ukraine. Uh, will be continued, uh, but again, the, there is there is not a high level um, war official like military officer. So we will see in the nearest future many other cases with many other like dramatic stories behind them. Uh, you know, and you see that international groups of investigators walking around and working in Ukraine and helping the Ukrainian prosecutorial team to collect and find evidences. It is going on. It will be going on. It will be results. But again, I hardly believe that we can bring Putin, Shoigu and his company to the responsibility, saying at least in the nearest year or two or even five. So we're almost out of time, uh, Bodan, and I want to ask you one last question. You know, we see all the news every day in the New York Times, the Washington Post, about how the Russians are making advances uh, in Donbass. Um, yeah. we, are, we, are, you know, we, we are seeing all the damage to Ukrainian properties, especially including residences. Uh, we are seeing the refugees fleeing west. We are seeing the country being damaged to a profound degree, economically, socially, culturally. Um, can you tell us uh, what you teach in your classes in, in Kyiv? Can you leave a message with, with um, the American people here uh, mm -hmm. about the status of this and the expectations of this and how you feel and your students feel and the people you know in Kyiv? How do they feel about this? Where do they see this going? How strong is their resolve? How do they feel about the Vladimir uh, Zelensky and his leadership? Um, what's the state of affairs? Like uh, the best news uh, for us now is uh, new and new weapons and new arms from United States, including and especially from United States and here Ukrainian people. Uh, more than grateful for the people of the United States because of their help and military aid. It's beneficial one, it's important one, and we expect sometime to have uh, 300 kilometers range missiles on HIMARS system, MLRS system. <laughs> and again, uh, Russia can continue its offensive operation on Donbass, but uh, you see no one is willing 
to be defeated here. We know Russia will uh, make genocide, which is now making, and uh, President Biden confirmed it. Genocide is a crime about all other crimes, you know, evidently. And uh, it's basically the role of the United States is to support us more in terms of weapon, in terms of uh, financial support, and to find a way to bring Russia responsible. It will show again the leadership of the United States. I know that people of the United States probably are concerned much more about like the domestic topics, which is evidently too. But uh, you cannot simply ignore genocide happening somewhere in the world, uh, happening close to the country, which always was in strategic cooperation with the United States. Okay. Uh, Bodan, um, it means um, from God, right? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Dan Bernadeschi, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for thank you. Uh, your your views um, and your, your call to action. Uh, let me say that although you and I are half a world away, uh, we here in Hawaii support you, and we want you to prevail and succeed and remain a, a, a beacon on the hill of the liberal world order and to preserve um, Preserve uh, democracy, if you will, around the world. So, it's appreciated so much, and we feel it. Thank you so much, Bodan. Aloha. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.